In this series, we invite academics at the University of Pretoria <coughs> who have been recognized by their peers as experts in their respective fields. And tonight you're going to be hearing from one of our younger scholars in the University of Pretoria community who has been recognized by his peers, both locally and globally, as an expert in this particular field. So I now wish to introduce him more formally, but in doing so, I do wish to direct your attention to the brochure before you where there is further information uh, about our lecture this evening. In brief, Professor Lorenzo Fioramonti is an Associate Professor of Political Science here at the University of Pretoria, and he also holds the Jean Monnet Chair in Regional Integration and Governance Studies. He also directs the Centre for the Study of Governance Innovation here at the University. He holds a PhD in Comparative and European Politics and has published over 40 scientific articles in international journals, including in the list the journal Development in Practice, Development Dialogue, European Foreign Affairs Review, Third World Quarterly, the Journal of Civil Society, the International Spectator, and African and Asian Studies, among others. Professor Fioramonti has coordinated the activities of three research groups within the prestigious EU FP7 program and has received funding for his academic work from a number of other sources. And I mention these because it signals the level of expertise that will be shared with us this evening. These funding sources include the European Commission, the European Union Delegation to South Africa, the South African Department of Science and Technology, the Flemish Government, the Italian Ministry of International Affairs, the False Falcon Foundation, the Heinrich Paul Foundation, and so the list continues. In his 14 years of academic experience, Professor Fioramonti has built a significant research network with some of the most prestigious universities in the world. While his thematic focus was initially confined to democratization studies, he's gradually expanded his scholarly focus. And it now covers a wide area that includes the role that supranational institutions play in fostering democracy, development, and social cohesion. Our lecture this evening, I do, as I've mentioned already, holds the Jean Monnet Chair in Africa. And I wish to especially mention that this is the first of its kind to be awarded to a chairholder at an African university. And it's the most prestigious recognition awarded by the European Commission to distinguish academics. His most recent books, and one of them is on display this evening, and I'm sure you will hear more about that later, include titles such as Gross Domestic Problem, The Politics Behind the World's Most Powerful Number, and we'll hear more about that. Regions and Crises, New Challenges for Contemporary Regionalism, published by Paul Gray in 2012. He has several other book titles, each of which is an intriguing. Uh, invitation to read further and to get to know his work uh, in more depth. It is now my pleasure to invite our guest speaker this evening to address us. Professor Fioramonti, we look forward to your address. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this lecture and thanks everybody for being here. I mean, it's a beautiful day out there, it's sunny, and I know very well that you would rather be out there having, taking a walk or having a drink than listening to me tonight. So I'm really appreciative of your patience uh, tonight. I, I've tried my best to turn this lecture, also to invite you then to buy the book, of course, but to turn it into something that is captivating and interesting to everybody. So I presume it's going to be as accessible as possible and entertaining. Um, as I know that we live in a world in which everybody is in a hurry, also because of our obsession with GDP growth, I've decided to offer you a preamble to my lecture. 
So it's going to be a short animation movie. It's going to take only two minutes. And it's going to say more or less everything I want to say in the other 40 minutes. So if you're then uh, satisfied, you can actually walk out and you know more or less everything that needs to be known. Well, of course, it's not the end. It's just the beginning of this lecture. And I hope you're not satisfied with this, or you're going to want to listen more about the history of GDP. So um, what, is, you know, what is this amazing but short life of GDP? We're so used to GDP. We hear about it every day that actually very few people know what GDP is, what GDP stands for. And often, very probably almost nobody before actually decided to write a book remembered what the history of GDP was. Um, so it's actually a rather short history. Even though we hear about it every day, GDP is a recent invention. It was invented in the 1930s. At that time, it was the Great Depression, and governments were desperately looking for a monitoring tool that could tell them, basically, whether their policies were being effective or not. And that's when a guy called Simon Kuznets, it was at, that time, at the time he was a senior researcher, he was almost my age, a senior researcher at the National Bureau for Economic Research in New York, arguably the most important economic think tank at the time, and he had a very simple idea. He said, why don't we collate enough information about consumption of production and services and put it together into one number that would uh, rise in good times and would fall in bad times. And his uh, argument was so convincing that in 1937, the US Congress gave him the mandate to set up the so-called national income accounts, which are a system of surveys upon which the calculation of GDP is based. That was 1937. A few years later, what happened? The Second World War. And Kuznets was invited by President Roosevelt to join the War Production Board. So why would an economist with a passion for dry numbers be invited to a work planning office? Well, because Roosevelt wanted to know, basically, if it, his own war plan was feasible, economically speaking. And Kuznets used the data that he had to tell the president that he wasn't. That the Americans got it wrong, and they wanted to get involved in, in, into the war with an all-out project, immediately, with a massive conversion of the industrial sector in the US. And Kuznets said that would be a mistake, because, because it would stifle consumption, and in the long run, it would actually backfire. You, the Americans wouldn't be able to sustain the war effort. At that time, no, we know the war ended in 1945. But at that time, they didn't know how long it would go on for. So they needed to plan accordingly. And Kuznets had two suggestions. First of all, let's use the GDP accounts to map out areas of economic production in the country that are underutilized, whereby we can turn them into the munitions program immediately. And then at the same time, sort of encourage private consumption within our country so as to be able to generate enough resources that could then be used to pay for the war. 
And this is what actually the government did. So it changed the plans, listened to the economists, and in a few years, the American, the American economic growth seemed in, in, uh, you know, like endless and capable of reaching unprecedented levels, unlike all the other uh, parties in the war. All the other uh, countries in the war were suffering economically. America was the only one going up. In 1944, um, the U.S. government could produce in one month as many airplanes as it had produced in the whole of 1942, just in two years, because of this economic approach to the war. Now, because of the um, hist historians would later on find out that, for instance, Hitler's plan was fundamentally disconnected from the capacity of the German economy to sustain the war effort. So it's true that Hitler was defeated militarily, but he would have, also, he would have been defeated anyway economically because his plan wasn't connected with the capacity to harness the potential of the, of the German economy. And this is why economists, I don't know how many of you know this, but economists usually refer to the invention of GDP as being as important for the victory of the West in the Second World War as the invention of the nuclear bomb by the Manhattan Project. The two big inventions that allowed Americans to win the war. And, um, and um, this is why, you know, like, um, uh, at, that, at the end of the war, in 1945, Americans were the only country with an intact industrial sector and pent-up consumer demand that put together uh, basically explain the economic expansion of the, of the United States in the post-war period. So this is the first fa phase of the history of GDP. What is the second phase? The second phase is, begins with the Cold War. At that time, the Soviet Union wasn't using GDP as a measure of economic performance. It was using another metric based on Marxist economic theory. It was called the gross social product and specifically the material product. There were many differences between the, the two ways of calculating economic performance. The most important one was that the Soviet measure only focused on industrial output and did not consider all the service industry that was, by contrast, included in the GDP calculation. So you can imagine at that time the rivalry between the two blocks, the measure of economic performance became as important as the, as the arm, arms race between the two. They needed to show to the rest of the world that either communism or capitalism were the best way to achieve well-being and, and, economic, and economic success. And this is why for about 40 years, the, 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 you know, like the, the, the difference between statistical accounting sort of triggered what I call a stats war involving the secret services of both powers. And the CIA, the, C the Central Intelligence Agency at that time, became a laboratory of statistical analysis. Now, when we, think, when we think about the CIA, we tend to think about people that are good at handling guns and at martial arts. But if you look back and you, you, you read what the, the composition of the CIA was at the time, it was mainly staffed by economists. Their, tar their role was to discredit whatever propaganda, whatever declaration coming out of the Soviet Union to show that the expansion, the so-called Soviet miracle, was simply a result of statistical manipulation. And they did it for 40 years. And in the 90s, it started actually paying off. Because when Gorbachev was elected head of the party, he started introducing a transparency reform known as Glasnost that we've all studied. And as part of that, he wanted a statistical office in Moscow to reform the statistical accounts. And he argued that time had come for the Soviets to embrace GDP. Interestingly, the CIA in 1989, because of its expertise in the field of GDP accounting, was tasked with organizing the first secret meeting between uh, Soviet statisticians and their American counterparts so that the former could be trained in, um, in, in the calculation of GDP. They went back four months later, as you know very well, that was May 1989. In November the 10th, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall comes down, communism is gone, and you know, the leadership of the Soviet, former Soviet Union cheerfully embraces both GDP and the market economy. And that's the end of the second phase in the history of GDP. The third phase, is when GDP becomes the be-all and end-all statistics of economic success throughout the world. Even in Europe, 1992, with the adoption of this master treaty and then the Stability and Growth Pact, countries that used to have a model of welfare based on social spending decided to actually tie their hands to GDP. Nowadays, in the, in the whole of the European Union, you can only spend uh, on housing, social security, education, and healthcare if GDP goes up. If it goes down, you have to cut. That has become a golden rule nowadays in the whole of Europe. 
Um, international institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were tasked with exporting GDP to the rest of the world. At that time, a number of countries, including African countries, did not know how to measure GDP. They were relying on other types of statistics or no statistics at all. Some countries, even nowadays, are not able to measure GDP properly, including South Africa at that time and the IMF and the World Bank went out there to teach all the countries of the world how to measure GDP and how to integrate GDP into policy making so that it could become a policy device. And um, if you think about global governance, the G8, which is the utmost club of leaders in the world, is simply based on GDP. It's the seven biggest economies in GDP terms plus Russia. So GDP runs global governance as well. And the recently established G20 follows the same rule. It's the G8 plus the fastest economies in the world also in GDP terms. And also our beloved BRICS that everybody talks about these days. It was invented in 2001 by Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs in which he said these are the fastest economies in the world in terms of GDP. By 2030 they're going to replace the G7 as the biggest economies in the world. So, um, and in 1999 the US government proud of its mission of exporting GDP to the rest of the world, actually had a big party in Washington celebrating GDP as the great, one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. And if you go on and check the proceedings, you see all these Nobel Prize winners coming together and reciting and discussing the many virtues of GDP. That was 1999. And that ends the third phase in the history of GDP. The fourth one is the one in which we're living, in which increasing concerns about climate change and environmental degradation the, you know, the consequence of CO2 emissions on the environment because of economic growth and industrial production. You know, the main, the ra uh, rising, con um, growing concerns regarding the impact of environmental uh, degradation on our lives, but also the social impact of economic growth at different levels in terms of work, work-life balance, and so on and so forth in developing and developed economies. So this is on the one hand as uh, one, one trend. The other one has started in 2008 with the fall of Lehman Brothers. We have realized that actually GDP hasn't made our economies more stable than before. We keep having recurrent crises every four years, ever since the 60s, every four years we've had a crisis at the global level. This has been the biggest one so far that has triggered the seemingly endless recession um, in which we're still living nowadays. And this has triggered an ambivalent debate. On the one hand, concerns with climate change and environmental degradation made people think that maybe it's time for us to rethink GDP, to rethink the idea of growth the way we have it. On the other hand, a lot of people say, well, this is not a good time to rethink GDP. Now we need more GDP, more growth for people, people to work to put our economies back on track. We can stop and think. It's not time to think. And some political leaders have played into this ambivalence. The first one was the former president of France. It didn't pay out, of course, because he's no longer the president. Nicolas Sarkozy, that in 2007 established a commission on rethinking GDP and economic performance, led by Nobel Prize winners Amartya Sen and Joe Stiglitz. He was followed by the prime minister of the UK, David Cameron, that has forced his statistical office to include, I don't know if you know this, happiness questions in the new national service. So now the Brits are asked how happy they are when they wake up in the morning to sense what our government is doing well or not. And uh, followed by the Obama administration that has set up a commission on subjective well-being, um, had it also by another Nobel laureate, Daniel Kahneman. And uh, finally, in April 2012, even the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, went on TV and said squarely, GDP has betrayed us. Now we need a new economic model that is able to combine environmental sustainability, economic stability and social progress. And he called this one the gross global happiness. But what is this magical number? How many economists are in the room? Please, please don't be ashamed, ashamed and raise your hands. Who could tell us in one sentence, short sentence, what GDP is? Who dares? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, okay, well, economists tend to be shy when it comes to their own field of work. Um, GDP is simply a measure of market output. So it's represented by this equation, okay, don't get scared. Stephen Hawking says that the number of people that do not follow you is proportional to the number of equations you have on a presentation, so like, I only have one today. But it's basically the sum of all consumption. C, investment, I, government spending plus exports minus imports. It's based on money. It only measures the money that flows within the market economy. 
What does it mean? It takes into account only things that have a price tag. So the price is the core of the GDP system of account. What implication does that have? Something that we would say well, is rather intuitive. Well, first of all, that all the things that make our economic uh, system possible, and even that actually increase, are you know, all the transactions that happen without, outside of the market or without a price do not get counted. Let me give you an example. How many of you have got kids? Well, you know that when you have kids, you have two options. One is to hire a babysitter, an educator, to look after your kids, and you can do and do other things. And some people say, well, that's not a great educational model, but still. And you pay this person. In that case, you're helping GDP. But if you stay at home, you make sacrifices, you try and look after your kids and give them a type of education you believe in, you're not helping GDP. You're a GDP enemy. Um, in terms of food, for instance, you have an option. A lot of us would say that it's better to try and know what you're eating when you, when, when you eat it and maybe to, you know, to grow your own veggies and uh, do it organically so that you know what you're getting in, into your body. Uh, well, or the alternative is to go to a local supermarket, buy something that has been prepackaged with a lot of plastic that ideally comes from very far. Well, in the first case, you're not helping GDP because you're consuming what you produce. In the second case, you're going by the market, even though it's unhealthy, you're helping your economy to grow. The same thing can apply you know, if you take a couple of hours off, as I said earlier, and go for a walk for free, simply enjoy the weather, enjoy the, the public space without spending any penny, you're not helping your economy. You're a bad economic actor. If you're in the country, if you, get a, if you use your gas gasoline car, go on a safari, get some booze, and even draw, uh, drive, you know, throw it out of the window so that somebody will have to pick it up later, you're being an economic hero in terms of GDP. <laughs> Everything that is new gets counted in GDP. What is used, recycled, reused, does not get counted in GDP. So this is why we're li living in a society that discourages reusing and forces us to buy stuff anew. And the utmost enemy of GDP is whatever is free. So what is the freest thing you can think of? It's Mother Nature. Mother Nature gives us a lot of things for free every day. And these things make our economy possible, make our societies actually possible, but especially our economy. This is a graph that I think is very telling. The darker line going upward is GDP growth globally ever since the 1960s. The light gray one going down is the uh, diminishing biocapacity of our planet. And you can definitely tell that the two things tell different stories. On the one hand, we have been growing our economies. On the other hand, our planet has been suffering and our resources are diminishing at an alarming rate. You know, nature contributes to GDP because we wouldn't be able to have agricultural production without nature giving us things for free. Sunlight, rainfall, uh, the soil, and all the different, type of different types of ecosystem services that make everything possible, our production system possible. But also, nature gets affected by GDP because of the result of economic, of economic production, industrial production, uh, in terms of environmental degradation, in terms of pollution and depletion of resources. So GDP neglects, neglects nature twice. This is why I think GDP should rather be renamed as the Global Debt-Based Ponzi Scheme. Now, how many of you know what a Ponzi Scheme is? I think a lot of you, because thanks to Bernie Madoff nowadays, no, no, everybody knows what a Ponzi Scheme is. So, but basically, I would like to give a comparison between how the economic crisis we're living in was started and how the GDP world works. Let's use the, the, the metaphor of the economic crisis. First of all, you know that it all started when people decided to use their homes which economists consider to be capital, as disposable income. So how do you turn capital into disposable income? You go to a bank, you take out a loan that you're not going to ever be able to repay, and you turn it into cash. You have an illusion, the illusion of having produced money out of thin air. Then you use the money for consumption, for whatever you want. You slice and dice it in many different securitized packages, and you sell those securities to the rest of the world, which is what all the Goldman Sachs and so on and so forth have done. And then, you get an illusion. The illusion is that we have been producing wealth out of nothing. And this system can go on and on and on until we have people that take new loans that can be used to repay the old ones. When the system stops, you have a domino effect like the one that, like the one that was started by the fall of Lehman Brothers in September 2008. Well, the system of GDP is similar. Instead of a home, you have the biggest home, the home with a capital H. You have Mother Nature providing a lot of things for free. Then, through a number of extractive uh, practices, we turn that thing for free, it, uh, that is given to us for free, into what we call you know, production. That production gets analyzed by statisticians, put into crude numbers of GDP, and then sold to the rest of the world, and we call it economic growth. 
And this can only go on and on until Mother Nature gives us the same things for free and we're not depleting Mother Nature uh, f uh, faster than we can replenish itself. An interesting element of the history of GDP is what I call the Frankenstein syndrome. Now you know the story of Frankenstein, right? So there was a guy, Dr. Frankenstein, in this case Mr. Kuznets, and there was the creature, in this case our number, GDP. Well, it's interesting when you go back and you study how GDP started, that the person that invented GDP was the first one to say, don't use it, you know, don't use it, this is not a good measure. But of course it had been so successful to win the war that nobody listened to Mr. Kuznets. And he said in his early writings, he said something very, very intelligent that a lot of economists have forgotten. He said, be careful when you use GDP because GDP hides inequalities. Luxury at the top can easily offset increasing poverty at the bottom. GDP averages everything out. You don't see that. You think you're growing, but you're growing unequal. He also said, if, because it's designed to serve the market economy, it destroys, when it's used as a political tool, it destroys non-formalized economies. So Kuznets was very clear, he said, GDP should never be used in developing countries, because in developing countries a lot of economic transactions happen outside of the market. And if you use GDP, you're going to manipulate and change that process. He said that using prices as estimates of value is fundamentally arbitrary, and we're going to see why. And he also said that he was forced to include the military expenses in the calculation of GDP because they had to win the war. That was a big chunk of the economy at that time. But then his idea was that you finish the war, you finish the war is over, you take out the military expenses. Of course not. Nowadays, military expenses are a significant portion of our GDP growth all over the world. And he argued, in what way can you justify that military expenses is a good thing for an economy anyway? And he also pointed out the fact that income that grows is not always a good thing. Income growing has a reverse side, has a hidden side. More income can also come at the expense of other important things. And so we shouldn't be naive about income, gener generation of income. And also that he said that GDP growth creates problems, negative externalities that then people have to defend against, be it you know, like environmental degradation, pollution, and so on and so forth. So people, in order to defend themselves, they go out and they buy devices that push GDP up. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, whereby more GDP causes more GDP. And he also said it makes no sense to talk about the quantity of growth. What policymakers should be talking about is, at best, the quality of growth. I mean, tell Mr. Gordon or President Zuma that, or even Mr. Manuel, that in the National Development Plan, they told us that if, if South Africa doesn't grow at 6%, we're doomed. Or even the DA that says that if we don't grow at 8% a year, we're doomed anyway. So he said, it makes no sense to speak about those root numbers. You have to decide what you want to grow and why. And finally, he said, remember that what is included in GDP is a decision I, I, I took, and I was living in the 1930s. And he said, each generation should have the right to rethink what gets included into this number and what gets excluded because the values, the norms, and the principles change over time. But of course, it wasn't successful. GDP had been so good at winning the war that Americans and the rest of the world didn't want to let go of it, and the foot soldiers became all of us, the, the, you know, the modern consumers. What is the core of this whole problem? The main core, the whole GDP lies on one big dodgy number. And this is called, we all know this in South Africa, Mr. Price. So Mr. Price is the problem. When you base any measurement on Mr. On Mr. Price, you know, as an, est as an estimation of real value of something, you get really confusing results. First of all, because prices are affected by political relations, including the existence of monopolies, the existence of subsidies, you know, the fact that lobbying can give privileged access to certain sectors uh, um, instead of others. Technological innovation is also counterintuitive when it comes to prices. I mean, you'll know that if you buy a laptop nowadays, it probably costs proportionally less than the laptop you bought five years ago. So, but it does much more, and it adds to your utility much more than the laptop you had five years ago. So if we were taking only the price, this would be counterintuitive. GDP would go down by supporting innovation, because innovation bring, brings prices down. So statisticians so have invented, in order to resolve this problem, GDP deflators that try to push up the price even when the price goes down. And this has created a number of interesting manipulations and differences across the world. Hedonic models using 
the pleasure that something gives you, irrespective of the price, in order to account for technological innovation that otherwise would be misleading if we were only looking at the prices. And also the other element is the question of government expenditure. I mean, uh, an economist in the 60s said that the assumption that what government spends on something is in line with what the citizens would have spent for that thing is a theoretical assumption valid perhaps in the best governed countries in the world, but definitely not valid for the majority of countries in the world in which actually citizens are not even taking into consideration when it comes to that. I imagine this, a country in which there is a lot of corruption, for instance, where by an arms deal, you know, it costs more than it should be. That adds to GDP. A country like America that has a dysfunctional healthcare system that is adding to GDP because it's very costly and that is adding to economic growth. A country like Cuba, for instance, that has a rather slim, pretty successful healthcare system that costs very little is underestimated because of GDP and that's why the Cubans have reformed their GDP accounts. Finally, other important things, GDP is gross domestic product. It, it, it takes into account only what is produced within the territory of one country, within the borders of South Africa in our case. Um, what it means, it means that we take as our own production also what foreign companies do here. However, you know that a lot of foreign companies then bring the money elsewhere. So it counts against the South African GDP, but in the end, that money doesn't always stay within South Africa. So it's a bit of a fictitious process. And also, this is why, for instance, Japan refuses to use GDP. They use gross national product, the predecessor, because it takes into account what all the companies that have headquarters in that country do else all over the world. So it doesn't matter whether you're based in Japan or not, as long as you're Toyota, you count against the Japanese uh, economic growth. And this is why, you know, like, Japan has a different system, and when you compare the two, you see that if you measure it in terms of GDP, the country's been stagnating for the past 20 years. If you measure it in terms of GNP, the country hasn't been doing that that poorly or, um, across, across during, during the past uh, two decades. But also look at what happens in terms of value added. Imagine the case of a t-shirt. A t-shirt is produced in China for five dollars and then it's sold to a German company. The German company buys it for five dollars so you add five dollars to the Chinese GDP then the shirt is flown to Germany and it's sold for twenty-five dollars to a German consumer. Then 25 minus 5, it counts towards the German GDP for $20, and the Germans haven't done anything. The whole value added was added in China, and the Germans take credit for it just because they have extracted the value and brought it elsewhere. So this is why some Marxist economists argue that you know, the value added of GDP should be rather seen as a value extraction rather than and this is a graph that I've taken from a bunch of colleagues in, in the US. They, these statisticians have tried to deduct all the manipulations, the different types of calculations that sort of change the way in which the Bureau of Economic Analysis measures econo um, economic growth every, every quarter. And you have two lines. The light gray one is the official GDP rate in the US ever since the mid-80s. The dark gray one is what would be if we had controlled for all those manipulations. And you see that it's interesting. I mean, maybe we don't believe in these statisticians. We don't have to accept it. It's their own idea. But it's interesting that they argue the recession in the US actually started in in, after 9-11, in 2001. We're simply worsening a recession that was already there, that was masked by statistical manipulation. And GDP is characterized by what I call the laundromat effect. We have already seen some, aspe some aspects of this. First of all, inequalities are cleaned up, as Kuznet said. Look at this graph. This is comparing GDP growth with the growth of inequality around the world. It's a perfect correlation. Countries are growing, are growing more unequal. It also, the bads of economic production are recolored into goods. As I said, all, take for instance, you know, like polluting industries, all the costs of pollution are never included in GDP. So you end up having this very interesting case whereby all the polluting industries' negative externalities are never counted as detracting from economic well-being. The only thing you see in the end is the money that they produce. And that's why we have a lot of, we have a debate that is often skewed when it comes to the importance for the national economy of the coal industry, of the oil industry, and so on and so forth. All industries that have a heavy environmental impact because all the bets, all the negative externalities are never considered. It's up to us to pay for them one day for our children. And finally, all the other productive activities are never taken into consideration. As, as, as I've said, our economies are not simply composed of what happens in the market. Our markets are possible because there is a substrata 
of economic interaction that is based on our social capital, it's based on, on our social connections, it's based on what nature gives us for free every day that makes our economies possible. None of this is ever included in GDP. So if you deplete your, national re your natural resources, if you deplete what you think can extract more value from your workers, even though that is not sustainable in the long run, that's going to reflect positively in your GDP accounting. What is the result? It's that you get in the end, the result of business becomes the only net producer of wealth because all the negative externalities are taken out and all the other known business pro uh, productive activities are not even considered, so by default, only business and markets are producers of wealth. If you think of GDP as the tip of an iceberg, we're only looking at what is coming out of the water. That's what GDP looks at. However, you know that the iceberg exists because there is a bigger part that's underwater we don't see unless we're driving on the Titanic and then they realize that actually it was bigger than they thought. But that is fundamentally important. However, because of our policies designed on, on uh, reinforcing the tip, we tend to consume the bottom. We consume the bottom more and more and more. And in the end, if we do not take into the consideration that thing we're going to end up in, potentially, some countries have already ended up there, in a situation whereby economic growth becomes impossible because you have you know, sort of um, depleted all the conditions that made it possible in the first place, and the iceberg disappears. When I was writing a book, I also thought, I mean, as a political scientist, is it possible that GDP is so powerful because there were some guys in the boardroom somewhere orchestrating a global conspiracy to support GDP? And then I remember the filmmaker Michael Moore, the once said, I do not believe in conspiracies, come on, except for those that are true, of course, you know, like, and in this case, <laughs> We know that conspiracies have existed. Ever since the 1970s, when the, bi the biologist Rachel Carson wrote the first book showing the environmental consequences of the use or usage of pesticide and fertilizers in the US. Silent Spring, a beautiful book. She ended up dying of breast cancer, by the way, and I think some people argue that maybe also because she was studying the pesticides to understand the impact that they had on human health as well. Well, ever since the 1960s, in 1970s, the, the Club of Rome's report limits the growth. They, all these publications, the beginning of an environmental conscience in, in throughout the world, especially in the US, were immediately opposed by a clear and strategic and orchestrated reaction by conservative think tanks, research institutions, the military industrial complex, extractive industries and the fossil fuel industries that supported some of the people you see here. They supported the con so-called contrarian research, trying to dispute the connection between tobacco smoke and cancer, for instance, trying to dispute the very existence of the acid rains, of the depletion of the ozone layer, and more recently, the existence of climate change. These people have been funded millions and millions of dollars every year by the very industries that benefited from GDP. And the main goal that we see throughout all these years is that we shouldn't worry about GDP growth. That's not a problem. We need more growth in order to be able to produce innovation that will one day uh, save us all and rid us of all the problems that GDP growth has caused. But in the end I think that the real cause of the power of GDP is more subtle. And I think it's the persistence of a psychology of denial among leaders around the world, wishful thinking combined with hubris among economists in the world, herd mentality especially in academia among people that should know and they haven't, haven't said what they, what they knew, and conformity and complacency across our societies. Okay, these are not my words. You want to know where they come from? Well, in 2009, the Queen of England went to the London School of Economics and she was upset. So she asked all these economists a very simple question. How come that in spite of all the money we give you, none of you could actually predict the breakout of the economic crisis? And of course, they were so embarrassed that they didn't respond. But a couple of days later, they wrote a letter, the, Business Economic, sorry, the British Economic Association wrote a letter that was published by The Guardian. And they said, Your Majesty, you want to know the truth? The problem is that we suffer from a psychology of denial. Our institutions are marked by wishful thinking combined with hubris. As economists, we follow a herd mentality. And more than anything else, our universities are complacent and conformist when it comes to, to alternative thinking. But the good news is that the critics of GDP have grown over time, especially ever since 2006. Some of these used to be worshippers of GDP, so be careful. But you know, it's never late to change your mind. So it's a good thing that they're coming to this camp. Um, we can divide them into two groups. Those that think that GDP should be reformed. Uh, basically saying, well, GDP is bad, but it's not so bad, so we can actually find ways to uh, improve it. 
And here you find the Organization for Economic Development Cooperation, the OECD, the European Union, the World Bank. All of these organizations have programs to rethink GDP, to improve GDP. The United Nations has been producing an alternative index called the Human Development Index ever since the 1990s. Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about dashboards and the green GDP in China in 2004, a very interesting case of political fallout, actually. And the GDP plus, the idea of actually trying to deduct the, the environmental and social costs of GDP from the calculation of GDP itself. And then you have the more radical ones, those that believe that GDP should be replaced. And here you find those economists, mainly econo ecological economists, that have been working for so long in the field of genuine progress. You find the King of Bhutan, very famous these days, that in the 70s launched the idea of a gross national happiness index and ever since 2006 has been measuring happiness in Bhutan. And then the many indices of well-being you find around the world these days. I think the interesting case is this man here. Do you know who this man is? Dr. Jim Young Kim is the new head of the World Bank, the new president of the World Bank. Well, this man, before becoming notorious to the rest of the world, this man used to be a well-known phys phys physician in the U.S. And um, in 2002, he wrote a book about healthcare reform around the wor uh, in the developing world. And he wrote this sentence. I'm going to read it for you. The idea that robust economic growth will automatically lead to better life for everybody is comforting. Unfortunately, it is also wrong. The quest for growth in GDP and corporate profits has in fact worsened the lives of millions of men and women. 2002, he was unknown. Then Obama decided to nominate him for the, for the biggest, um, you know, for the big chair at the World Bank and all journalists and commentators went looking for what he had said in the past. And that was a can of worms. Everybody got upset. The economist said, can you believe it? If Mr. Kim was hoping to lead Occupy Wall Street, such views would be unremarkable. But the World Bank promotes growth because it helps the poor. If he disagrees, he should stick to medicine. This is what the economist said. The Financial Times. The Mr. Kim is the first ever president of the World Bank to be anti-GDP, when even the bank's critics know that growth is what we want. And then a number of commentators you know, compared Mr. Kim to Fidel Castro. They said he was actually a, a friend of uh, Noam Chomsky and so on and so forth. And somebody said he even hates capitalism. So Mr. Kim was asked to go on a global listening tour. He went around, he spoke to policymakers and to in, in business leaders around the world. Afterwards, he came back to the US and he wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times in which he said, Sorry. Today, more people live in fast-growing economies than at any time in history. I recognize that GDP growth is vital for investment in health, education, and public goods. And on the 16th of April 2012, Mr. Kim was elected president of the World Bank. If this is what is happening at the macro level, there are interesting things also happening at the micro level, at the grassroots. Um, mainly because of concerns about the, um, the running out of resources upon which we base our economic, our economic model. And nowadays, it's not unusual to find people speaking about degrowth, the idea of actually planning for a system in which our economies will not grow anymore, will simply become stable, what John Stuart Mill used to call the stationary state. And you have more and more examples of transitions to low carbon economies around the world, especially in Europe and in North America. And these people believe in consumer, prosumerism, which is basically the idea that you don't have to always be a consumer and consume what other people do for you, but you can produce and consume the same things and share within your own communities. And that increases well-being. Some of these people have created local markets where they grow veggies and exchange veggies at the local level. They produce their own energy. They refuse to buy energy from the big companies the ASCOMs of the world, and, um, and this has been growing in developing countries as well. This is just a map, a bit updated, of how popular transition initiatives are around the world. Nowadays in South Africa there are 10 transition towns that are trying to do this at the local level. Some of these groups have also rethought money. Money is a big important component of GDP. I'm not going to get into the, de into the details, but they believe, you know, like in order to get to change this model, we're going to have to also rethink money. They have introduced alternative currencies. They're interest-free, an important, important element. 
And uh, these span across the world. The Bitcoin, for instance, from Japan. You have them also in Germany. That is the country with the largest amount of alternative currencies, even though it's a, it's a country in a good economic shape, which means that not always countries that, not only countries that suffer economically resort to these measures, but also countries that do well economically. And this is a quote I took from a person that I've interviewed was the, for the book, which was the founder of the biggest alternative currency in the US. He says, national currencies are all crumbling because they're all in debt with nature, since modern human economies extract from nature faster than they replenish. Local currencies are capable of reconnecting our economies to the planet. I think what is important about all of these examples, some of them are inconsequential, some of them are disconnected, they are not completely coherent. However, what they have in common is that they're trying to open up a debate, rethinking, repoliticizing GDP, something that we have simply assumed unquestioningly for too long, and they're trying to open up that debate at the local level at least. So in conclusion, if you think of GDP as a circle, whereby production leads to consumption and consumption reinforces production. We know all too well that throughout history, uh, many attempts at including, for instance, taxation for social justice purposes have been rejected on the grounds that they would hurt the economic cycle. And labor regulations, think of the mining industry in this country. No way, you cannot touch it because every time you have a strike, every time you have a reform, our GDP will suffer. And environmental regulations, you don't even want to go there, you know, like it. Everything has been postponed because of the fragility of the economic cycle. At the same time, we have accepted that we have to subsidize this economic system to keep it going. That we have to introduce all possible pro-market reforms in order to uh, make it even more sophisticated. What is not marketized is not sophisticated these days. And that we have to get ourselves in debt or in debt with nature in order to make this system possible. And even though there is plenty of evidence nowadays that when countries grow, unless there are serious reforms, they tend to grow unequal. I mean, I think South Africans know this very well. Brazilians and the Chinese, you know, remember that China has become one of the most unequal societies in the world. Even the Chinese party has, the, uh, the, the Communist Party has uh, in, um, uh, published a 35-point plan in January in order, to, you know, in order to identify new ways of tackling um, inequality because they fear it may simply destroy the Chinese miracle completely. Nowadays, the Gini coefficient independently calculated in China is only second to Brazil and South Africa and the whole world. And also, and also we have to introduce, we also realize that this connection, this sort of golden connection between employment and GDP, and we have GDP, we need GDP to create more jobs, is actually less, more, um, more loose and more uh, debatable than we think. And we even have introduced new terms like jobless recovery that we hear about a lot in the US these days. And that begs the question of whose recovery that is, if it's jobless, of course, but you know the answer. And even though all the, all the people that questioned GDP in the past were ridiculed by their peers. And countries around the world, including South Africa, have become just like this little cat, waiting for Godot, waiting for economic growth to bring us to another level of plenty, to a, to a happy society where everybody's going to be happy and all the inequalities will be resolved. And this hasn't happened in history, hasn't happened anywhere, and it's definitely not happening in Africa either. So, the circle has become a vicious circle. And in 1992, 1982, a Yale economist, Charles Lindblom, compared GDP market model to a prison. He said, markets, when they are focused on GDP growth, become prisons. Because every attempt at rethinking, at moving, at changing the system is automatically punished with the threat of unemployment, with the threat of economic collapse. But he also said, where there are jails, there are jail breaks. And I believe that by questioning GDP, we stand a chance to regain control over not just our economies, but also our democracies and our societies. And since I started with the video, I'd like to end with another one. It's a bit outdated, but it's very inspiring. And probably most of you have heard this, have heard this speech before, but I still think it's really inspiring. And here you go. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. That close natural product becomes air pollution and cigarette advertising, an ambulance to clear our highway of carnage. It comes special lock for our doors and the jail for the people who break them. It comes with the destruction of the redwoods and the walls of our natural wonders. 
psionic portal. It counts napalm, and it counts nuclear warhead, and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our city. It counts Whitman's rifle and spec knife, and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross natural product does not allow the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. I think this speech is very inspiring, and even though it's an old one, and it's a bit, you know, like the audio is not perfect, but I think it's really good. And the conclusion is that it's just a number, but behind this number, there's a whole political world. And I believe that by attacking the number, by rethinking the number, we can easily open up new space for innovation for new ideas to come to the fore and change the world. Well, that's all, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for this question. Uh, uh, I'll be very brief. I mean, I've been in the country now in my current capacity for about eight months. And I still have a three year work permit. In, in, uh, so I've decided deliberately of not getting into the politics in South Africa because I really value my work here and I don't want to be expelled from this country for what I have to say. So, um, but. Suffice it to say that, um, that the National Development Plan, in my view, is a, an elegant attempt um, with a lot of African uh, knowledge and also sentences and beautifully edited, a way of representing old ideas, ideas that nowadays are being contested everywhere around the world, not just in the developed world, but also the so-called developed world, but also in the emerging economies and in, in the world at large. And I think in a country like South Africa, there is a tendency of not trying, of not really um, sitting and trying to understand the problems for what they are. And as, as I said, as I say in the book, and as I said in this presentation, GDP wasn't invented by Africans, it wasn't invented by the Chinese, it was invented by a bunch of statisticians sitting in New York. And it was then exported to the rest of the world. One thing that surprises me is that um, 
Um, even though our governments are so fond of criticizing the Washington consensus, even though the whole BRICS community is based on the alternative world that these emerging economies would like to build, at the end of the day, their very nature is uh, Western. You know, like it's a, it, they, they've built their own reputation, their own policies, their own democratic systems on a number that was imposed on, on them. So uh, what I'm trying to explain is that if we're serious about finding alternatives, finding ways of of reducing unemployment sustainably, not simply in, in statistical terms or temporarily, but sustainably, then we may need to play the role of leaders as Africans, as South Africans, as the BRICS. So far, there is a lot of mocking and copying from the Western world rather than real innovation. So that's my answer. Uh, my name is Simon Carr. I'm currently a interesting researcher at the uh, Human Economy Program at the Humanities. And I found a very interesting answer what you were just describing, but I would now conclude that it's more about our economic system rather than about GDP. So I would just, you were just mentioning already that uh, kind of alternatives, but what would that be? Do you have any kind of vision where we should drive our economy to in the next couple of 10, 20 years, like not only for South Africa, but even more for the whole world? Thank you for this question. Um, this is the typical question that I dread every time. When people say, okay, well, I agree with you, but what's the alternative? And they're like, geez, you know, like, it's like, it's like somebody who smokes, and you say, you should stop smoking. Yeah, but what else can I do? And, you know, it's like, uh, so, uh, but I agree with you, and it's, it's a very common question, and something I've been grappling with, and actually I have to say that I'm writing a second book that should try and go in that direction. But I think the response is, the system, the way we have constructed it, has a, lo a lot of, dark sides. Now, those dark sides have come to a tipping point. Now, it's true it's our economic model, but our economic model is based, by, is based on one number. So if we think of changing the world by attacking the economic model as a whole, we're not going to fill rooms, we're not going to find uh, friends and partners. We're going to only find enemies and people that reject it as anti-capitalist or socialist or whatever that, that means. I believe that by targeting one number and showing what is the politics behind it, we may sort of walk all together in the direction of changing our economic model in a way that is more friendly, less uh, abrupt, and less uh, revolutionary, if you will, but still sustainable. Um, what, I think one topic that all these countries, all the, the whole world will have to deal with is a, con a, a, a planet that is finite, that has a limited amount of resources, in which people cannot grow forever, even the number of our demographics cannot go on forever. When will we need to sit down and think that maybe time has come to identify a new model? I mean, there is a lot of research on steady economics, for instance, you know, like a steady, steady state economy. What does an economy that doesn't grow look like? It's not an economy where people suffer. It's an economy, an economy where people suffer is an economy that is designed, this is very important, that is designed to grow and doesn't grow. Because our economies are designed to grow, and when they don't grow, we have this mess. We have the economic recession. But economies can be designed in different ways. And I think the, 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 the future will be about sitting down together in South Africa, in Brazil, in China. If the Europeans and the Americans don't want to listen, we go ahead. And we say, you know what, maybe our leadership role is to identify new ways. And also by taking chances. By taking chances and identifying future paths, even though they sound so incredibly complicated. Which is not true. The Human Development Index was invented. I mean, the human, I don't know how many of you know it well, but the Human Development Index is basically based on three uh, components. One is GDP. The other one is education, and the other, and the other, and, and the third one is life expectancy. I mean, like you could say healthcare in general, health. Health, not healthcare. Okay, so three, okay, so three different components. Uh, Amartya Sen, the guy that invented the, the Human Development Index, I mean, it was in, in, invented by him and a friend of his. And there's a chapter in the book that's all about the Human Development Index, so you could, you could read more there. He was against even the Human Development Index. When, um, when his uh, friend, you know, like, I hope, you know, like, invited him to say to the United Nations to say, Amartya, help me identify a number to replace GDP, he said, Are you crazy? 
you, you cannot do that. It's crazy. It's, it's, crazy. Impossible. it's impossible. Like their their GDP is bad because it coll it collapses everything into one number. We cannot get another number that is going to be following the same rules. And then he got a call back saying, you know what, Amartya, his friend said, I just want you to help me get a bad number that is going to be just slightly better than GDP. And the market said understood that it was worth it and tried to do it. I mean, the HDI has a lot to say to its credit. And the HDI beware has been changed three times ever since 1991 when it was introduced. Now they have an inequality adjusted HDI, which tells you that the previous HDI wasn't adjusted for inequality, which you, know, you can understand what it means in the developing world. So I would say the reflection on the politics of GDP is fundamentally new. In the past, ever since the 1950s, all critique of GDP was based on its own inherent flaws and trying to identify better numbers to replace GDP. I think it's important to start a debate like this, that we understand the political ideology be be behind GDP before we can embark on any other alternative. Otherwise, we're going to make the same mistakes of people that did that in the past. And the HDI, as you know, by having incorporated GDP, basically, has remained an issue for academics. How many policymakers, how many times has Jacob Zuma mentioned the HDI in a state of the, union of the, state of the nation address? How many policymakers don't even know what the HDI is? I mean, some social scientists and political scientists and economists use it every day, but it's, 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 a, it's a product for a niche with inherent flaws, but still limited because it doesn't question the political ideology behind GDP. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I'm going to move over to the, the next uh, part of the agenda. Uh, but before I do, I once again want to invite you to engage with uh, Professor Fioramonte um, in the foyer. I'm sure he's going to take up a position close to the store where his, where his books are. And uh, I'm sure the books will, be, will help him to explain some of the issues that you will raise with him. I'm now moving over to the vote of thanks, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the first person I need to thank would be Professor Lorenzo Ferramonte for a very stimulating, as I said, provocative uh, presentation. When I was asked to, to, to stand in and chair the session, I, I accepted the invitation um, uh, very gladly because I, I, I have read your work and, and, it, and I found your book was quite stimulating and I look forward to the presentation and, and clearly uh, you have not failed based on the amount of interest that the audience has shown. Secondly, I need to thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Cheryl Ray, for hosting the presentation as part of the Vice Chancellor's Expert Lecture Series, and an expert lecture series which adds enormously to the intellectual life of the university. And thank you, Professor Delaray. Of course, I also have to thank members of the diplomatic community uh, for their presence here this evening and for the interest that they have always indicated um, for the work of the University of Pretoria. Um, obviously, I also want to extend thanks to or thank the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Deans, Deputy Deans present here this evening, colleagues, students, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, 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 for being such an appreciative audience. Thank you for, for coming and participating. And I, I think a very important uh, um, event in the academic life or the intellectual life of, of faculty and the university. And uh, lastly, I obviously have to thank the, the colleagues who have assisted in organizing this meeting, sending out the invitation, organizing the cocktail to which I'm going to invite you in a minute. Uh, uh, I don't see those colleagues here, but I, I wish to thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I think we, we owe Professor Pierre Montes a last round of applause for this. Uh,